I'm very happy to present um, uh, some of my research. Um, the one that has uh, occupied me over the last uh, eight years by now, because it has been, it's a very large data gathering project. It's, it is one of the largest uh, data gathering projects um, on regional organizations. And the topic that I would like to present today is um, the normative purposes of regional organizations, insights from the comparative regional organization, um, uh, Regional Organizations Project, which is how we call the project. Now, um, regional organizations are of importance. I'm uh, very sure that you know this already, but perhaps you don't know that there are so many regional organizations out there. So all um, larger projects which collect data on regional organizations come up with a figure of um, about 75 regional organizations that exist as of today. And if we count all those predecessors, then we know that there have been 118 regional organizations. Now, <clears throat> their relevance becomes already clear when we look at uh, news reports. Um, these are the ones of the last week. And there you find that, um, for example, the African Union has been in the news because it has joined the G20. The African Union is a continental um, regional organization which um, spans all countries of Africa. Then the Arab League has, in the new, has been in the news because of the recent Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, where the Palestinian Authority has called on the Arab League to um, mediate in the conflict, which is one of the major functions of regional organizations. Then we have ASEAN, which is a very lively, um, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is one of the most important um, regional organizations in Southeast Asia, is about as old as the European Union, and has been struggling with the rise of China because China influences the politics of some of its member states, which um, splits ASEAN and, and, and it could not agree on very important questions like the conflict in the South China Sea. However, it does have ideas on other um, issues that are of interest for the member states, in this case, um, food security. And the only one which is not in such a good shape and um, has been discussed as an organization that is not as lively is the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation. Uh, this is one of the um, headlines. Uh, SARC is dead, long live sub-regional um, cooperation. And SARC has been plagued by um, yeah, mistrust among its member states. Um, but as we can see, regional organizations, even if we look beyond the European Union, which is actually one of the most important regional organizations or considered to be one of the most important ones, um, re uh, regional organizations are there and they are a global sort of phenomenon. And this is also underscored by this graph, which um, shows quite um, drastically how much the number of regional organizations have increased over the last decades. And we can see that um, the figures um, are um, uh, that in Africa, which is the red line, um, the number of regional organizations has increased tremendously. But also other countries, Europe, where many of the uh, Eastern European countries have formed new regional organizations, have increased its number, as well as in the Americas and uh, Eurasia more broadly, um, and the Asia-Pacific. Okay, so we know they have increased in number. We know that they are important. But what we don't really know is what they look like um, and what they focus on. Um, and if we look at uh, past research on regional organizations, then there are broadly perhaps three trends we can identify. The first one, and this is quite important because it has um, impacted in how we view regional organizations is that there has been a focus on regional integration, understood as the setting up of um, governance structures on a regional level. 
and regional integration research commonly um, distinguishes between supranational integration and intergovernmental integration. Supranational would be the ones where governments actually um, select individuals um, to represent them. The ideal sort of, uh, of supranational integration would be the EU Commission, where you have commissioners but not governments who are sitting on the table and determining policy. And then we have intergovernmental integration, which is where the governments are sitting around the table and determine policies. And the EU is perhaps the one which is the most, um, the most integrated in terms of supranational integration. Um, most of the other regional organizations commit more to intergovernmental um, 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 integration and we, um, synonymous um, terms for supranational would be delegation and for intergovernmental would be pooling. Okay, so research on the European Union in these regional integration terms has dominated research on regional organization. And this was especially um, um, visible during the 1960s and the uh, early 2000s, where almost every publication on a regional organization sort of took the European integration experience as a standard against which other regional organizations integration was being measured. So, um, and this is when we also see that some organizations were categorized as successes, those that sort of followed the European integration experience and others uh, were considered less successful um, because they did not follow or sort of did not have the same um, level of integration as the European Union. So the highly influential uh, Euro, um, regional integration research and very much inspired by the European experience. This changed in the mid 90s and early 2000s when we had um, a different literature that considered much to a greater extent that outside of Europe, um, regional organizations were being founded and they look quite different. And um, one person that has um, influenced that kind of research perhaps most significantly is Amitav Acharya, um, who took ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, as a case study to argue that we should um, look at regional organizations and we should do research on regional organizations quite differently. We should not take the regional integration experience of the Union of the European Union, but we should sort of look at regional organizations on their own terms. And he argued that in fact ASEAN, which is which um, with its very sort of less formalized um, way of um, integration, uh, very little um, institutions, um, no sort of uh, in, no institution to which um, member states have delegated powers is actually the counter model to the European Union. Um, and what um, distinguishes this research also from the European integration um, research is that it focuses much more on the historical foundations of regional organizations, its cultural foundations, and less on integration and um, the economic um, integration. And then finally, there's a third phase of um, regional organizations research, which takes regional organizations much more as a subclass of international organizations and basically argues they are actually of the same type. The only sort of difference is the limitation in membership. So we don't have global membership organizations, but membership is limited to neighboring countries. And here, we have also seen larger data sets. The most important one, perhaps, the correlates of war data set, which puts international and regional organizations together to look at how they influence conflict dynamics in international relations. So here, the focus has been more on institutional design questions and the question how autonomous or independent um, international and regional organizations are from member states. Interestingly, it draws a lot from European um, integration research in the sense that it also deals with the concepts of pooling and delegation and takes them as um, types 
through which um, um, regional organizations um, gain autonomy. So these are the three phases. Um, and finally, um, over time, there have also been and always been um, efforts to document um, what regional organizations um, have sort of what the foundational documents of regional organizations are. So we have many treaty collections on regional organizations, which sort of um, show um, what the um, constitutional foundations are, um, why those organizations have been founded, and how they, have, how they differ in design. Um, we have um, this one, um, the international organizations, which um, includes the treaties of international and regional organizations. And then for Asia, Michael Haas, um, uh, vol um, volume sort of spanning um, documentation of Asian regional organizations. What we did not have were efforts to sort of survey those documents in a systematic way to find out whether regional organizations systematically differ or um, show systematic similarities. And this is where the Comparative Regional Organizations Project comes in. It is um, a survey project where we coded the treaties and amendment documents of all regional organizations. Now, that sounds easier than it is because first of all, we did not know what regional organizations were out there. So basically it was one of the first projects to establish the, what I would call almost exact number of regional organizations. Um, so, and we had to go through many libraries to uh, sort of unearth the original treaties because what you find published online are usually amendment treaties and not the original ones. But since we were interested in their institutional design from a longer perspective, it was uh, really important to get the original treaties. So we coded those. With the regional organizations project comes an analytical shift. The first one is we are less interested in the question of um, autonomy of international or regional organizations, less interested in how much integrated they are, we are more interested in the institutional similarity. The original idea was we wanted to know whether institutional designs diffuse among regional organizations, because as you might be aware of, the, the EU sees itself very much as a model for other regional organizations to copy. So the EU um, has done a lot of research and other researchers have done a lot of research on how far the EU travels. And I myself has been, has, um, have been quite instrumental in that because I have shown, contrary to what Amitav Achaya has said about ASEAN being a counter model to the European Union, that even ASEAN has taken over institutional design features from the European Union. So the idea was of this project was to, to actually find out whether this is a larger process, a more systematic process, whether other regional organizations systematically take over the design of the European Union. So this is the first, we were interested in similarity, not depths of regional integration. Conceptually, this also means that we are looking at regional organizations in a, as a wider concept. We are not uh, that much, um, we are among others interested in institutional design, and there, in a very narrow sense, what kind of organs do um, regional organizations feature? Do they have um, a supranational authority like a commission? Do they have a ministerial council? Do they have a parliament, a court, and so on, a dispute settlement mechanism of some kind? This was only one part of the question. Much of it also dealt with the question, for example, what are the norms that regional organizations commit to, a feature that virtually no other data project um, features in their data. So we are much more interested, we saw those founding treaties very much as constitutions of regional organizations, which could be coded and where we can really say, well, what are the norms they commit to? What kind of 
policy purposes do they adopt, what do they want to achieve, and then um, what, organize, uh, what organs do they establish to do so. And that also means a shift, a methodological shift, from a more deductive approach, as has been taken by much of regional integration research, which have abstractly defined delegation and pooling, and then tries to show how that maps onto the um, population of regional organizations to a more inductive approach where we say, well, we first want to know what organs does a regional organization feature, what norms does it have, and then we select a method that allows us to find structure in the data and come to more um, to, um, constructs and concepts that are closer at the data and are sort of formed inductively or not deductively. So overall, the Comparative Regional Organizations Project is a comprehensive longitudinal cross-sectional data set based on a survey of the agreements of organizations worldwide. So we are looking at a time period between 1946 to 2016. It's text-based. Um, we are looking at 75 organizations. We're looking at similarity and the whole project would not have been possible without the generous funding of the German uh, Research Foundation, which provided funding for seven years for the data collection. Sorry, Professor, if you can explain this one step back. I was wondering how this is, unit of analysis is uh, an agreement. Is it 75,180? Um, no, that is, sorry, that is 75. The unit of analysis is the RO. I should that's have, to, that's 75 and 118 altogether if we include Ooh. the ones, yeah, but I know the comma uh, for you is like the separator, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. but, um, well, I, um, I will not focus on that today, but um, basically um, what we did is we established a dyadic data set on regional organization so first of all, we sort of had the coding on the treaty level, and then we had to aggregate the codings to an RO level. So when I'm talking about the coding of institutions, then the agreement is the unit of analysis. When I'm talking about the regional organization, then that's the aggregation of the various um, agreements over time. So um, that was quite a substantial pro uh, process because um, ultimately, um, that means that you also have to decide which ones are important agreements. You need to know what are foundation and, and what are amendment agreements. And um, you have to figure out how to transpose that on a, and aggregate that for a regional organization. And that also sounds easier than it was ben, because for the EU, it has sort of this kind of treaty history where you can, ex where you can say exactly what the important treaties are. If you look at other regional organizations, like the African Union, for example, it doesn't do that. Um, and therefore, we had to find, we had to sort of determine ourselves what are the important treaties that need to be coded. Okay, so, and so ultimately, SARC, is, is, still, is still in the data set. Yeah, and we, I say something about SARC later on. But what I wanted to say, so we were interested in the similarity, so we had to compare every regional organization to another. And that means that we have created a dyadic data set which contains about um, 4,000 um, diets, um, regional organization diets. Sorry. Yeah, the correlates of war. Yeah, yeah. Cow has this kind of... Um, yeah, yeah. So it's it's really it's the it, exactly. So and this is also a point of criticism, right? That as soon as you create dyadic data, you increase substantially the number of observations, which makes it easier to find some um, some um, uh, sig uh, statistical significance. Okay. So this is our definition of a regional organization. If you might have wondered what exactly is a regional organization for us. Um, we are deviating from the correlates of war data set definition in so far as we are also including regional organizations that, that define themselves as an, as, an organization, as an organization but consist only of two members. The sort of 
standard definition is that it needs to be three members to differentiate reg a regional organization from a bilateral agreement. Um, we say they must be multi-purpose in scope. We are interested mostly in the multi-purpose organizations, not in the sort of um, unipurpose ones like the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OEPAC, which only has one purpose, and they must be sufficiently institutionalized. So we want to see an institutional structure, and that sorts out most of the bilateral treaties and especially also the uh, preferential trade agreements. So we, have, we had three project milestones. We coded the treaties. Um, we um, established a similarity index, which we called Regional Organization Similarity Index. And so we, since we talked uh, over lunch about the Bavarian Oktoberfest, Rosi for me has a specific meaning because it's a very popular woman's name in Bavaria, which is the country where I come from. So this is, uh, the, also has the purpose of popularizing Rosi as a name. And then we have um, the third step um, where we set up an additional uh, database on um, secondary variables which we uh, uh, put in the statistical analysis to find out where those similarities come from. Now, I can tell you, I could tell you a little bit more about similarity and also similarity over time. But I don't want to do that right now because um, the talk today is on the normative purposes of regional organizations. And perhaps we have time to talk about the similarities among regional organizations um, over time uh, later on. But just to give you sort of an, a very brief um, bite on that, um, and we would actually think that since we have seen such a tremendous growth in regional organizations over time that they also copy from another and sort of look at what other organizations are doing. So from a sociological perspective, which is quite popular in organizational research, we would actually expect that the organizations become more similar over time. What we find is that similarity over time does not increase, but it stays flat for the entire period under observation, which poses a puzzle. And um, we have also tried to answer that puzzle, but that will be uh, the topic of a different talk um, if I get invited again. So comparing regional organizations, that is our project homepage. And um, I encourage you to visit is it. Normally this comes at the end of the presentation. I, now we are, but we are only in the middle of it, just to not so that you think, oh, now it's over. Uh, this is our project um, homepage. And the nice thing about it is that you can sort of um, get at the data and select organizations to see where the organization of your interest, where it fares in terms of um, the categories that we have found. And what is quite interesting, um, our method, which I will explain um, in a minute for the, regional, uh, for the re uh, normative purposes of regional organizations, um, has allowed us to find several dimensions in the data, which dovetail with the categories that um, deductive research has found. But uh, um, it allows us better to sort of measure where the regional organization stands. So this is a radar graph um, where, we, um, where I've put in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the Indian Ocean Rim Association, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation. And um, broadly we find we are looking at three sort of dimensions broadly. Normative, what norms do regional organizations adopt? Then um, what policies do they adopt? And finally, what institutions do they adopt? And uh, sort of are there dimensions in the data where some organs um, are correlated and occur more often, where some um, norms um, co are correlated and, and occur more often, and where the policies um, are correlated among another? Let's, 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 uh, let's try to understand this. So I know a little bit about ASEAN. They don't hardly intervene in any 
each other's conflicts, right? So what, what is that dot there? How am I supposed to understand that? Yeah, this one. So the one below for conflict prevention. So ASEAN is the, your blue line, right? Yeah, exactly. What is that? So what is that? Yeah. So, um, actually, it's quite interesting because, you know, we are looking at Asian organizations here. And that means that if we would compare that to Europeans, they would be far out, outer on this, and this would sort of dwarf this graph much more, right? It be, would become much smaller. What it means is that um, what we have... Um, just look at this one, liberal, we are seeing liberal, Westphalian, and social justice as norms, as dimensions in the data, and I will explain that later. And what we see is that um, as compared to the green line, which is the South, um, which is SARC, sorry, um, ASEAN is much more liberal, SARC is more Westphalian than ASEAN, and in terms of social justice, ASEAN, um, contains more norms which express the dimension of social justice than SARC. The same is true for the policy areas. And here we also find three dimensions. One is the what we call location factors, sort of the classical uh, <clears throat> um, uh, labor capital um, um, factors in popular and economics, which is sort of liberalization policies and so on. Then we have conflict prevention and ASEAN actually does understand itself also as an organization engaging in conflict prevention. If you look at the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, it's all about sort of um, resolving conflicts. It's coming out of the treaties. It's coming out of the treaties, exactly. But here we are looking at an aggregate RO level, right? And then social progress would be those policies. And then social progress would be the policies aiming at gender equality, lifting up the, uh, the um, wealth and the uh, development of people and so on. And these are the institutions and here we found organizations, we found an intergovernmental dimension clustering uh, mostly those organizations where member states um, sit on the table, a supranational and a secretariat or administrative dimension. And here it is also quite clear that SARC is even less supranational, ASEAN is already very little supranational, but SARC is even less so. And the same if in terms of intergovernmental, they are quite similar. And in terms of the uh, strength of the secretariat, ASEAN is stronger than SARC. So this is the, the whole purpose of this data set. And the indicators that are there, uh, the mm -hmm. I explain that when I explain the normative purposes because then it becomes easier. Let's just say, so basically, the way I should read this graph is that the fact that this polygon is bigger than the uh, SARC polygon, so there's more ASEAN and more. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And this part becomes, and the reason why we only have um, two organizations here is that we are looking at 1991. Mm -hmm. And now, over time, you can sort of shift this. And then you see that in 2013, we already have, we then have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and we have the Indian Ocean Rim Organization. And this is how the two, this is Indian Ocean Rim and this is the SARC, um, how they compare to ASEAN and um, the, um, what was the other one again? The, and SARC, how they compare to SARC and um, ASEAN. And you can see that um, SARC on those dimensions is the one which, is, which has the fewest sort of norms. I mean, Westphalian and social justice figure quite strongly, but it's the least liberal among the, the organizations. Um, but in terms of social progress among those four, it's the one which places most emphasis on social progress. Why do you say it's still the blue line, right? So it's the least liberal? No, blue is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Yeah, so so liberal. liberal is here, blue, yeah. and then, yeah, I mean, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization has a little bit, it has one treaty that also has liberal norms, um, but, um, so therefore it's almost there, but, and then, at, at the, but then one has to consider that ASEAN does not feature that many um, liberal norms either, 
So uh, they are quite close here together. Shanghai has a little so bit of a. Is it closer to the central Yuan means what? You have more of that thing. Okay. Yeah, oh. yeah, you're more of that thing. You're more out, out. You're closer to here to the outer ring. You have more of that things. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, it's only it's not the practice. We are not exactly. We are only at looking at the treaties. So this was our interest. We wanted to set up the regional organization similarity index, and we wanted to look at the dimensions in those data. So now let's briefly look at the um, normative purposes of regional organizations. And I've said already that if we are looking at those um, normative purposes, not many other data sets are looking at it. So we are actually the first ones who have um, coded what norms regional organizations subscribe to. There are some publications out there that look at individual norms. So ASEAN, has it increased human rights commitment or not? The European Union, how does it sort of, when does it commit to human rights and how sort of encompassing is that and so on. So we are the first ones who look at this and this is quite, and why is it interesting to look at, uh, have a look at the normative purposes? Because if we take regional organizations as governance arrangements, um, then of course it might also be interesting to look at, well, do they commit to norms at all? And um, if they do, what kind of norms are expressed? Um, and very often regional organizations, if you look at the UN Charter, they are taken as important pillars of international order, right? They support the structure of international organizations um, as devised in the UN Charter. So when we know more about the norms that regional organizations commit to and how that changes over time, it might also tell us something about the um, development of the international order. And this is especially of interest as currently we are having a discussion on the future of the liberal international order and the question whether with the, um, with the increase and the rise of powers like China and India, whether the liberal international order is under threat because they promote more Westphalian norms and so on than, uh, than Western powers. And so when we sort of look at this discussion, then our data set might provide um, an, op an, op an approximation to an answer uh, to this, discu uh, to, to this uh, discussion and question. So um, we take the same approach as um, I have just uh, briefly indicated and I just um, and explain that. So we overall coded 25 norms where we surveyed each treaty and then aggregated that to an RO level um, and asked, do you commit or do, does the treaty um, mention human rights? Does it mention um, non-interference, the non-use of force? Um, state sovereignty? Does it feature gender equality and so on? So we looked at 25 norms and surveyed each and every uh, treaty accordingly. Here we are looking at only the founding and amendment treaties, the most important ones. Uh, no, here we are actually only looking at the founding treaties. So we're looking at 148 um, agreements and then we aggregate that. Now, the statistical analysis uh, or method that we used was is explorative factor analysis. Uh, we have binary data. Explorative factor in the analysis is actually a data reduction technique. It seeks for the structure within data that, um, um, is, that re replicates sort of the overall uh, data, um, but with very few variables. So what it looks for is sort of dimensions in the data which are indicated by items that are correlated highly. That means, um, and sort of it lists those items and also provides a measure of statistical significance. And those dimensions can be seen as factors or a structure in the data, but we can also see it as latent constructs within the data. So if those correlations actually have meaning for what they stand for, then we can talk about these as 
latent constructs in the data. Now, what is nice about this is that um, this method comes up with some um, very intelligible um, dimensions. Um, so we see that um, there is that basically a number of norms correla correlate. These are the rule of law, human rights, and democracy, and which, is, which constitute one factor which we call the liberal factor or liberal dimension. Then we have um, other norms. These are um, non-interference into domestic affairs, the non-use of force, sovereignty of member states, the equality of, among member states, and political independence. And we can say these stand for the Westphalian dimension. And then we have some norms like social justice, common values, human dignity, human and social well-being, social solidarity, and international peace, which also correlate and form the third dimension. And this is the dimension. Here we are just looking at... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, um, we are just looking at the way we code it is, was just like we asked our coders to look for this term. So does it mention social justice? And then it was coded as yes. And if it doesn't occur in the treaty, we say no. In the, in the EFA, in the uh, explorative factor analysis, such items are nevertheless called variables. So they don't vary. Mostly also because we only have um, binary data, so they vary at zero and one, but it's, it's not that sort of social justice as such increases. And then EFA looks at, and then we sort of ask that for each of this, these items, whether it is mentioned in the agreement or not. Right? So, and what EFA does, it simply looks at, well, if a treaty mentions social justice, does it also mention non use of force? If it mentions common values, does it also men, uh, mention human rights? Yeah? So, and it turns out that um, some of those items correlate, so they occur together, and these are the ones that are in bold, and others are less likely sorry, um, to correlate, and therefore they are um, not, uh, they don't cluster together and they all might be on a different dimension, right? This is how this comes up. Okay, <clears throat> and we, from this, one can calculate factor scores, which provides a score for how many of those items in a, a treaty or organization mentions. And the factor scores then are the basis for the following graphs. And this is quite interesting because um, what we see, and this is, this is sort of over time, how do those um, dimensions on average develop? And what we see is actually that over time, all three dimensions sort of have ups and down, but from the 1990s onwards, all three dimensions increase. Um, we see here at the beginning that especially Westphalianism, um, I mean, we have very few organizations at the beginning and then they increase over time. These are average um, factor scores. But we see that um, the Westphalian sort of um, uh, line starts very high, then drops and then plateaus and then increases. Uh, the liberal sort of does the opposite. Um, we have very few organizations that sort of commit to liberal human, uh, to liberal norms. Then it increases, uh, goes down, and then increases again, and the same for social justice. Um, what is interesting is, especially against the backdrop of um, this whole hype about the international system becoming more liberal, um, every organization and every state sort of committing more to human rights norms, what we see is that this occurs, but it does not crowd out Westphalian norms. So it's not the case that organizations that commit to liberal norms forget about Westphalian norms. Um, what we see here is that all three actually increase. So we don't see that whenever an organization 
sort of um, says we want to we want to promote human rights, that it does not uh, or it doesn't seem to be the case that um, uh, the liberal uh, the Westphalian dim dimension becomes um, uh, less strong. All two dimensions, the two dimensions. Yeah. Yeah, that would be an interesting question. I hope that I can answer that at the at the end, uh, or we can also discuss it, of course. Um, it's, but it's quite interesting, right? One wonders why why we don't see why the liberal sort of uh, factor, um, why the Westphalian doesn't decline when the liberal uh, increases and the other way around. So obviously, and we can sort of speculate about that, it seems my sort of answer would be norms as such are an issue of identity. These are in treaties, right? No, we are looking at the aggregate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's a, yeah, but it's not just cheap talk because we have, for example, um, one organization uh, in, in the um, in in Eastern Europe, which um, has included Westphalian norms, human rights norms, and so on, and they just say in their preamble, we don't think that these norms are mutually exclusive. We actually think they, they all go together, right? ASEAN is also a very good uh, example for an organization that commits to Westphalian norms, explicitly says, we, um, we promote um, sovereignty, we think that so uh, so the sovereignty of member states, um, non-interference into domestic affairs, non-use of force are important international principles, but we also commit to human rights, right? So that occurs all the time, but it is a quite interesting feature, but it, it contradicts our notion that either you have human rights or you have a Westphalian system, right? So that is not occurring. Now. Is there, I, guess what, I, mean, I don't know research research, so mm. ask, is there some research that says whatever is in treaties is actually done in practice? Is there some correlation? Well, I would say, um, um, if we ask the lawyers, they say, yes, treat, um, states think a lot what they put in their treaties. So it's not just cheap talk. And then there are others, and these are the realists, who say, well, I mean, they can put in their treaties whatever they like. Um, they won't sort of stick to it. So it depends on whom you ask. But considering, I mean, when we coded all those treaties, what we found really uh, interesting is that um, some organizations obviously have a very, very hard time to include specific norms. So, for example, the European Union, until the Eastern European countries joined, did not have, did never mention the principle of sovereignty I in its come treaties. To, come to think of it, there is no state that is totally Westphalian or no state that is totally liberal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly, and that is the interesting point. I will just I will say that about this um, that when we are talking about dimensions, and it means require also to some extent. Yeah, exactly. When we are talking about dimensions, it means that those dimensions are present in all regional organizations. It's not that we have only the liberal ones or the Westphalian ones exactly, but they we have that in all. And one of the in one of the next graphs. I show you how it comes together. Now, but looking at those sort of three dimensions over time, what we have done here is we have sort of differentiated among those, uh, those organizations uh, depending on when they have been founded. So we were interested, how do those organizations that have been founded immediately after 1945 how they have, or how have they developed in terms of their, those dimensions? What happens to those who have been founded during the decolonization period? And what happens to those who have been founded after 1990? So the three sort of um, crisis periods after World War II, uh, the decolonization period, and uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, how the, do those organizations behave? And what is quite interesting is they behave quite differently. So the older organizations hardly, and we are just looking at the liberalism factor, 
hardly increase their commitment to liberal norms. They stay, I mean, we have this slight uptake, but basically it's relatively flat, right? So when we're talking about older organizations, not much happens. When we're looking at the African and Asian um, organizations, which have been founded during the, um, and uh, Latin American organization founded during the decolonization period, they are the ones who substantially increase their commitment to human rights. And those after who have um, sort of, um, who have uh, been established after 1919s um, significantly increase their human rights commitment. Um, so they behave quite differently. So when we are talking about the liberal order and sort of the strengthening of the liberal international order, then this is driven primarily by organizations outside the West. Um, they commit um, mostly to it. Now, briefly, um, again, what is quite interesting, um, the, the older organizations sort of start, because these are the, the, the only very few ones, right? Um, they uh, sort of, uh, the commitment to Westphalianism drops and then stays um, or plateaus relatively. But also here, the commitment to Westphalian norms increases over time, right? So it's different sets of organizations and it depends on when they have been founded, um, how much they commit to those normative purposes. So that is um, actually what we found quite interesting um, that when we are talking about who promotes the liberal international order and how, to what extent do organizations uh, commit to, we see um, substantial differences and organizations outside the West obviously play an important role in that. So uh, if I, uh, are we supposed to kind of uh, look at these uh, graphs together or mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I just compare uh, the organizations post Cold War, mm -hmm. so are we, are, are we suggesting that organizations uh, were liberal, but they were not doing enough uh, towards their social justice? Uh, because one, uh, towards, for liberalism, uh, the lines are moving upwards. Yeah, whereas for social, social yeah. justice, it's, it's going down. Right? Yeah. Then, it's going up again. And then it is going up again, but yeah. in the initial years, uh, when there's some kind of well, here you're mostly looking at the Eastern European um, states and regional organizations because they were the ones who were founded um, and some African organizations which were founded afterwards. And so you have to remember that most of them were aligned with the Soviet Union. So basically they did not have a regional organization because everything was related to the uh, Soviet Union where they had one. They also shared the principles. So they are actually quite high on the social justice dimension because there are two sort of groups of states where we can say they promote the principle of social justice and these are the sort of capitalist welfare states on the one hand, but on the other hand, the socialist states, because they have, I mean, in socialism, it's all about social justice, equality, and so on. So we can say that they started high, but then sort of because their commitment to socialism with liberalization actually lessened, the, the sort of in this dimension, it goes down. And then at one point, they realize that they have to sort of um, get that commitment back again because of the sort of um, internal frictions that uh, rapid ra uh, liberalization actually um, uh, means. And therefore, they increase in also in their treaties their commitment to social justice again. So I think that if you think about those states um, who form those organizations, then this makes absolutely sense, this development, right? Okay, now, over... We also see regional differences, and here I'm, I would ju just like to focus on, and very briefly focus on the, um, on the um, most, on liberalism and Westphalianism. And perhaps briefly, um, for Westphalianism, we don't find sort of that many, um, we find differences, but not uh, strong ones. But if you look at liberalism, there are um, differences between uh, Europe and Eurasia, 
which commit much more to liberal norms than other regions. And you also see that in the Asia Pacific, the variation is actually um, uh, less. Now, your question about how does that play out in, in regional organizations? And this is a graph, and I shifted it. Normally, it's, it's around uh, 30 degrees um, in the other direction, but I wanted you to I wanted you to see it properly, so this is a, a better sort of size. And here we have listed all organizations um, and how much they sort of, um, and their factor scores on those various dimensions. And it is ordered according to most liberal to less liberal. And these are the, um, the values for social justice in pink and green is for Westphalianism. Now what you see, um, is that African organizations like COMESA and Caribbean organizations are the ones which are, um, uh, which have expressed mostly or have the highest uh, factor score on, on, on liberal norms. And um, then it goes down and, and perhaps just one thing to read this graph. Um, if with factor scores, it's like zero, the zero line sort of indicates an average mentioning of those norms. Less than the zero indicates below average mentioning of those uh, norms, and above zero indicates an above average um, mentioning. Yeah, the, the interesting thing is SARC. Which one? Yeah, but that has to do with the fact that um, NATO does not have, yeah, NATO doesn't have that many. Um, yeah, there, because there is one treaty where it, it, it uh, expresses its commitment. And it does not only have, yeah, but that sort of shows up, you know, it also shapes uh, the practice of SEO. And you, don't, you do not only have autocratic um, governments in SEO, right? So, yeah, 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 exactly. So it's highly autocratic. Yeah, also, if you look at OIC, there is the last treaty is highly liberal. You know, they have written in their last charter um, uh, revision almost all human rights norms that you can mention, right? So some sort of because there are small openings through the democratization of specific countries, for example, which changes their treaties. Um, in, in For ASEAN, for example, in 2007, Indonesia was actually quite, um, quite um, uh, yeah, did promote human rights norms, so they show up, yeah? Okay, but what is interesting, if you look at SARC, it doesn't mention liberal norms, but it's very high in terms of Westphalianism and social justice, right? And then, of course, you have also a number of organizations. You also have a number of organizations which do not mention norms at all because they started as a um, free trade agreement like the European Free Trade um, Association. And, and they, had, they don't mention until today, they don't mention any norms at all. And you have the European Union, for example, which um, until the early 1990s did not mention norms in its treaties and only in the 1990s actually started to mention human rights and then later with the, inter with the enlargement by Eastern European countries even mentioned um, sovereignty for the first time. So if we look at the EU, which is here, then you can also see that <clears throat> It does have a little bit reference to Westphalian uh, norms, but very li little and below average. But its references to liberal and is also, surprisingly, social justice norms are actually quite high. So this is, um, as I said, it poses some, some puzzles um, um, why it is the case. Yeah, I think in the South countries, good on social justice mm -hmm. with sexual yeah. 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 I'm I'm not sure. So when, uh, for example, the factor scores are drawn on a computer, uh, uh, regional uh, regional offices or regional organizations are comprising of uh, 
uh, more than at least two or more countries right? mm. uh, representing uh, certain traits or norms that uh, you are uh, focusing on. Uh, so, for, for example, uh, if there is a regional organization which is which is comprising of only three countries, mm. say, compared to a regional organization com which is comprising of seven countries, and both of them, when they are uh, demonstrating one particular norm that you are yeah, studying, yeah. Are you, or is the score also using some kind of weight? Uh, to no. Of, no, no, because our unit of analysis is the treaty, okay. right? So only if we look at the secondary variable, variables, then we are looking at aggregate data of the member states where we aggregate that on a regional level. So for example, if we want to know how democratic is an organization, by its members, then we are aggregating democracy um, levels um, of each and every member state and average that, or we measure democratic density, for example. So in that way, uh, sort of the number of, of member states would, um, would be, an, I would say, an appropriate weight. But if we are only looking at the treaty and code that, and this is where this data is being drawn from, then we are not putting, we are not weighting according to the number of member states. And we think that that is um, appropriate. I also understand that you think, well, perhaps one should put a weight because um, agreements among less organizations are perhaps easier to, to write than agreements among more organizations, but this is something that we haven't sort of considered in the data. Yes, you're all talking about that. What's the analytical puzzle here? You would ask a realist, they won't see the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, first of all, the purpose is to make organizations comparable. So it's not the analytical puzzle is at the moment not there. The analytical puzzle is the first one that I mentioned. Similarity does not increase. That is the first puzzle. The second one here would be why don't we see, well, one could ask what determines those norms whether or not states commit more or less to those dimensions, right? And just briefly, because I have, I'm already over length, um, I want to provide an answer to that um, um, sort of not puzzle, but research question, because it's not particularly, it's not a puzzle. And, you know, puzzle would be, we have a phenomenon that is not explained by existing theories, right? Okay, so. We test uh, three sets of variables, liberal theories, um, whether domestic regime type has anything to do with it, IPE, whether glo pressures of globalization have anything to do with it, and world polity, sociological theory, whether there is a kind of um, diffusion um, effect through international organizations. What we find is that um, it is actually, well, democratic density does not influence whether or not um, regional organizations are taking up those norms. Um, trade is negatively correlated with those um, uh, norms, which is explained by the fact that, as I said earlier, some organizations, ex especially the trade-related, do not speak of international norms at all. Political globalization is consistently significant highly significant for liberalism and um, social justice, less so for Westphalianism, and the number of policy areas also um, is associated with um, the, those factor scores. So, so <coughs> this one? Um, I can't tell you that uh, right now. Um, so <laughs> that's M would be uh, 1604 is the number of observations because we sort of have those organizations. We have all organizations over time. Exactly. It's a panel data set. Exactly. It's a panel. It's the factor scores for each of those um, factors. Yeah, sorry, I should have, uh, uh, I should have said that. So I asked about total trade increases, total trade between the yeah. contracting countries? Between, um, exactly, between the contracting countries. 
expectation yep. increases, then they will be moved. Yeah. Decreases. Exactly. And as they become more democratic, as democratic density increases, there is no sort of statistically significant effect, which is quite matters. globalization matters, and especially political globalization. So the more sort of they are integrated in political structures, be it members of international organizations, or the more, the more they participate, the members participate in peacekeeping operations. We took actually the political globalization index um, of DREA and others, um, the more this commitment to human rights increases. And that leads back to the question why there is no crowding out effect. Basically, we, we could say that Westphalian norms, liberal and social justice sort of are all indications of a commitment to and they reflect an international order. Um, and um, the more um, regional organizations and their members uh, know about this, the more they commit in, to an equal sense in a way to those, um, to those um, three dimensions. So it seems to be what is so what is surprising here is that it is not related to the democratic status of member states, but it reflects much more international factors. So if we relate this back to the discussion about the liberal order, then we can th see that um, um, basically the liberal order has not is not sort of we can't say that it is that it has increased we can say it has substantially increased on liberal norms but we must also say well the westphalian norms have also become stronger so and this is a picture that if we only look at the liberal or look at this from the perspective of the liberal order uh, frequently gets gets lost so and especially um, we need to be cautious um, and we had this discussion over lunch about the, um, we need to be cautious to s simply say, well, as more states autocratize, this poses a threat to the liberal international order. We don't see that um, association. And it's much more important sort of what happens internationally. And here, um, those norms have been around for quite some time and um, influence also the design of regional organizations. So it's much more interested to uh, much more linked to international factors than to domestic ones. Okay, that was my talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure whether you have many questions left because <laughs> we have. Oh, okay. So yeah. I think you know this. So I think this guy Edmund Maliski at San Diego. He has a paper. He has some work where he shows that Vietnam, for example, right? They have elections every five years. Why yeah. do they have elections, right? And so they do some stats and they come to the conclusion it's because they want to make America happy. Because ultimately the same people keep getting yeah. elected again and again. Mm -hmm. So they want to show so it's window dressing basically. So I guess it's so this could be explained like that, right? So the autocratic states they still use these words as some sort of window dressing to keep America happy. Uh, uh, I mean you know, India also says it's the mother of all democracies or whatever. Right? Mm. Our, uh, our behavior is not showing that. So. Being handpicked, but we still have elections in South Africa. I have been in Singapore. I think it's just been always handpicked. We know who's going to come next. But still, you have elections. Because yeah. There is an international image which you don't want to tarnish when you have elections. Well, you can see it as purely instrumental. As I said, I think that lawyers would, international lawyers would strongly disagree. They would say, and also if you look at some theories um, like um, institutional rational design of international institutions, they would argue, nevertheless, states negotiate very hard about those treaties, and therefore it's not just rhetoric. Mm. It's really sort of, and as I said, since um, those norms, I mean, as we have seen when we look at the individual organizations, we also see that it makes sense, you know, some we know of are Westphalian, and it also shows in the data. And um, they have a very hard time of committing to liberal norms, or the EU has a very hard time of committing to Westphalian norms, right? So it seems to be an issue of identity or also of um, what the member states actually really want. I wouldn't say that it's completely um, erratic or rhetorical. 
Um, there, um, those international treaties are incredibly hard to negotiate, and, um, and as we have seen, I mean, just look at the WTO and so on, it's really states fight very hard about those treaties. So I doubt that it's purely rhetorical. What my sort of theory about this is, is more that we see commitment to international norms whenever there is um, international turbulence. So it's basically, I would, my theory about it, and I'm, I'm still sort of, I have to think about it and think about the argument, how I make it, but my theory would rather be it's about showing a commitment to an international order which contains Westphalian norms, liberal and social justice norms, and they increase, the increases occur whenever there is, um, states feel that the world is in disorder. So which has been the case after the Second World War, which occurred after the breakdown of the colonial empires and also occurred after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And it seems to me that states then feel a need to commit to those norms simply to, to sort of um, introduce an element of order again and say, well, the, the world might be in turbulence, but nevertheless, we show this commitment and we want it to work. That's my theory. And if you, I just checked and you know, perhaps you're familiar with Google Ngrams, which draws where you can put in a name or a, um, a frame, a term, and then Google draws on all book publications um, how and uh, gives you um, a line sort of indicating how frequently a particular term has been mentioned in those books and in, those, in the titles and so on. And if you put in turbulence, international turbulence, it dovetails exactly with um, those periods uh, um, se after Second World War decolonization and um, uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. If you, and it has a different, it has a different sort of um, dynamic than if you put in international crisis or international um, uh, security or something like that. So turbulence internationally seems to be a highly important factor to explain this. Um, that would be my theory. Sometimes the states come in, like if you take the American uh, commitment to the Clean Air Act mm -hmm, after mm -hmm. ratifying the UN FCCC, right, it goes back home, immediately yeah. passes the Clean Air Act. Yeah. While America's image, they were still playing the hegemon or a superpower mm -hmm. during the Cold War time. Yeah. But you see, entire international arena, which is kind of making the state not only fight or not just rhetorical, but also implement those treaties. Mm -hmm. And also, this is a strong country that we are talking about, right? Yeah. Who can easily pass on its polluting industries down south and clean its air and pass on all the pollutions yeah. to China, and we're fine. Yeah. And the international setting is also like that. Yeah. But these are the most. But now, if we talk about a country which are really fighting at the international mm. organize at the time of the negotiations, are the ones which are struggling mm. with globalization, right? Yeah. So even if it's rhetoric, it, the there is uh, there is a demand for it. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a demand, a platform to put your things. But how much does it get translated to real action? Yeah. Like what what I just gave the example of UNFCCC. Yeah. They, they might be trying hard, but how much they go back there? Exactly. Imperative to go back to implement that. Yeah, and I mean one and. I mean, that becomes especially relevant if you look at some organizations like ASEAN, which has a human rights commitment, but then also the Westphalian commitment and how difficult it is for ASEAN, for example, to do something against Myanmar, right? Against human rights violations. So, um, but, well, nevertheless, as I said, the, I think the interesting phenomenon, I, I find it more fascinating at the moment to see how it differs, right? Because we didn't know that before. And now at least we can say something about it. Stylized facts have been laid out brilliantly, but I have some questions. Mm -hmm. the analysis of the excavation part. Uh, can you just go back to the slide uh, where you were measuring how do you measure economic complexity? Like that's a new variable which uh, I really get to see. Ah, oh, sorry. I have to go into the other direction. Here. 
Yeah, economic complexity, we took the KFO um, globalization index, which has... Yeah. So these are binary variables, latent variables? Um, no, the those very the the norms are because uh, are factor scores, so they are continuous variables. Yeah, exactly, and those are also continuous variables. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And the last one is so what kind of estimation do you do in Kaggle? Uh, we took a time series cross section analysis and praise with um, praise Winston. Um, Panel Transformation, corrected. panel corrected standard errors, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Because I was getting confused with that, those, whether those, uh, you know, dependent variables, there's no one. Or mm -hmm. so no, no, they are the not binary. We use the factor scores, oh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And of course, we had some sort of serious um, uh, correlation, multi -cor correlation issues, and autocorrelation between, because obviously, whether the factor scores in, in one year also influences um, the factor scores of the next. So this is why we took the Praise Winston transformation. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering where you see this work going. Yeah. You know, the, um, the study seems to me very interesting, mm -hmm. but it seems to me to be the beginnings of something much bigger. Mm -hmm. Because now you are looking mainly at the treaties and yeah. what is meant to. When you compare it and people have been sort of hinting at this, mm. to the, what is happening in practice, mm. we might find a range of correlations or not. Yeah. But big questions of global stability mm. derived from regional mm. via international and vice versa, yeah. maybe it could lead to some really important work mm. because of the state of turbulence of the world as such. Yeah. Where do you see this going in the longer term? Yeah. I see this part of a much larger agenda on, on the work of international organizations. So where it has been in the past is, for, for example, when the Correlates of War project has looked at, well, does institutional design, the fact uh, how strong organizations are, does it impact on, um, on conflict dynamics, whether uh, states have wars or not, right? So this is a very practical influence of uh, organizations and a very um, and a, um, quite interesting insight also for practical reasons. Where I see this going, and this would be part of a larger research agenda on um, international organizations, is we want to know which design features influence politics on the ground. So, for example, if we just take, we've looked at the norms and we could actually ask, well, do those norms actually also determine um, what kind of organs are being set up, whether those organizations are more supranational or delegation, de delegative or more uh, on the pooling side. So we could look at this and um, then see, uh, or we could generally ask, does it influence whether, how frequently um, states intervene? Does institutional design um, have some effects on the effectiveness of the organization in solving problems for member states, you know, be it migration, health, and so on. So um, all this, um, since, we, the, since this project is about the institutional design of international organizations, then those institutional design variables could, can be connected to any other variable um, and also any other policy variable. So we could also, um, and also when people sort of start thinking about new organizations, which recently hasn't been the case um, so much, but we could provide them input in what would be a good design. So for example, there is a sister project and we took a lot of inspiration from this project, the Con uh, Comparative Constitutions Project which is uh, or was at uh, Texas University and where they coded the constitutions of states and they provided very practical input for uh, governments when they were about to design new constitutions. And they said, you know, if you're thinking about an article about um, the rights of indigenous communities, here is how other um, states have framed that right, right? So there you could give very practical input 
what would be good, a good design of an international organization. And then other research, of, and so I think that um, connecting sort of institutional design to some policy outcomes would be the next thing, but also sort of different, um, if we think about this and also how in terms of the norms, they distribute over space, one could see this as a kind of systemic competition which organizations or which norms are better in uh, sort of providing stability internationally than other norms. It might be, um, and this would be the Chinese model, that actually Westphalia norms are much better suited to solve some problems as are liberal norms, because liberal norms will always be connected to interventionist practices, whereas uh, Westphalia norms are not, right? And you could basically compare and see well, is it better to have a set of Westphalia norms or is it better, better to have a set of liberal norms? And um, is that better for international stability or not? So I think this would be, these would be the questions that might be relevant from a very practical sort of point of view. You might also want to watch the evolution of the treaty themselves. Yeah. Because I'm sure they're being revised yeah, exactly. over time as a function of world stability. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I showed with the comparison of the bar of the um, network graphs. Right. Uh, I, this is interesting. I, I, it reminded me of something, I, and Naresh has to react. This man was the executive director of a commission on legal empowerment of the poor, uh -huh. and he had to handle a set of commissioners like. Arnando Di Soto, The Economist, Madeleine Albright, uh, Justice uh, Kennedy of the U.S. Supreme Court, various finance ministers, uh, all including an economist from India called Arjun Sandhika. And they came up with a set of recommendations for the UNDP. And I'm a policy person in the regional office of UNDP in Bangkok. And it was my job to say to the countries in the region, please act on these recommendations of this committee and the making the law work for everyone, <coughs> Naresh principally authored. Then I found there was resistance to it. Mm. You know, that he, Thailand didn't quite want to do it. Uh, now, Vietnam, each country was resistant to it. But all of them, in one way or the other, said, now, if this were to be pushed by UNDP as something meaningful for the region, mm. right, then we are all willing to come along and we'll, uh, Thailand will host one meeting, Vietnam will host another meeting, and so on. But you want to pitch it as a problem affecting the whole region and not pitch it as a problem in this country. Mm. So that's when I discovered, oh my God, this ASEAN thing yeah. has some, you know, traction. Exactly, yeah. You know that? Yeah, I know, but I think what, what happens, so this might be interesting to you, and I don't know if you've thought about this that far, but you have a global body like the yeah. one I was leading. Yeah. The ownership at the regional level of mm. those norms are much less than when they seem to belong to that regional body. Yeah. So we did 22 national consultations, uh -huh. and we did some sub-regional or regional. Yeah. For example, we had meetings with senior people in Thailand mm. and India, and so on. But if you don't have these regional bodies engaged, and the norms and other recommendations seem to be owned by and recommended by the regional bodies, the ownership is much less. Yeah. And they want to see that before they act. Yeah. That could be one of the important dimensions yeah. of regional organization. Yeah, I completely agree because we frequently see that the, in the case of norms, the transmittance is from international organizations to regional ones. And then, of course, we have the African Union uh, or African organizations who say, well, but we also upload specific principles, our practices influence what the United Nations peacekeeping offices um, thinks and how it implements things. So, um, and therefore, I, all, I completely agree that the regional level is really important. And it also answers the question, is it merely rhetoric? I don't think that it's really merely rhetoric. They are really sort of, they are into this regional thing. And especially, I mean, 
ASEAN is one thing which, which also, even if some say it's an ineffective organization, but nevertheless, the regional spirit is there. And even more so if you look at the African regional organizations, which try to sort of, <clears throat> they, have re they identify so closely with regionalism, they have come up with this new regional model for the reform of the UN Security Council. They have come up with, um, even in, in my own association, the International Political Science Association, the representatives of, um, uh, of African political science associations always say, you know, we need to have a regional level for political science associations because it would, be, it would make our work much more effective, right? So the regional level definitely is a point of identification, international for organizations, but then also sort of for, for members. So that makes it relevant. But thank you very much for this idea. I really like it a lot. We should, yeah, exactly. But thank you very much for your interest and your questions. So we're going to give you some mementos. Oh. This is before the new building came up. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. I, I guess it's made in China. <laughs> <laughs> but it has Opijindal on it. That's the most important thing. <laughs> and then this is a, a pen with the flag of India. Ah, oh, thank okay, you very much. Because the benefactor and chancellor of this university, uh -huh. he fought a case. It took 10 years for ordinary citizens to get the right to fly the flag.